YouTube. In this video, we're going to uh, ask the question, uh, what makes for a successful commercial product, in particular, a successful camping gear product? Okay. Uh, is it numbers sold? Okay. You, in other words, is, is the most successful tent uh, or piece of camping gear, sleeping bag, or whatever, is the most successful one that has sold the most numbers throughout its history of production. Is it longevity? Is it the length on which that product stayed on the market and was sold in profitable numbers uh, even though other products had come out since the beginning, since it first hit the market. Is it that it was the highest selling product for a number of years, even though there were other alternatives that came on the market? In my opinion, all three, any of those three, would count towards being the most successful product. And today we're going to talk about a camping gear product that meets all three of those criteria. Okay, somewhere about 1893, uh, a guy named J.D. Wright started a tent and awning company in Binghamton, New York. Nobody really knows exactly when J.D. Wright started this company. But in 19, 18, as you were, 1895, an employee of his named Frank Barber bought the company and uh, moved it to another location and called it the Eureka Tent and Awning Company. Now, by 1925, 30 years after the company started, uh, through a succession of uh, owners buying and selling and buying partners out and such like that, uh, the Legg family ended up with sole ownership of uh, Eureka Tent and Awning. Now, the company's business had not been so much uh, as far as tents are concerned, hadn't been so much in the commercial market. Uh, they were actually making large tents, things like circus tents and festival tents. And that led in the Second World War, when the Second World War was declared, uh, the company stopped all other operations and dedicated themselves to making tents for the United States Army but they were large tents. They were hospital tents and maintenance tents and, and again, big tents like that. You won't see very many shelter halves and small tents with the Eureka brand on it. I'm sure they made some, but their prim primary business was in great big tents. Now, after the Second World War, <coughs> The Legg family uh, took a serious look at their market and they realized, well, number one, the agricultural canvas market was essentially dying off. Uh, improved methods of uh, storage and transportation and harvesting meant that crops would stay out in the field for uh, a shorter period of time. Uh, transportation was much quicker. Uh, trucks were no longer being covered with canvas, and of course, canvas-covered wagons had long been out of the picture. And the architectural canvas uh, market 
awnings on, on commercial buildings and stuff, well, that was pretty much drying up, too, due to air conditioning. Uh, now you no longer needed to shade your windows to keep the heat from building up inside your building. The air conditioning took care of that, and you actually could use the sunlight coming into the window to showcase the products that you had sitting there. One big realization they came up with was that during the Second World War, so many tents were made, manufactured. Tents of all sizes and descriptions were manufactured that even if the military sold off half of what they had in stock or in the pipeline in August 1945 when the war ended, they'd still have enough product in their warehouses to satisfy most of their needs for about the next 20 years, 10 at least. So they knew that uh, military contracts, what the canvas industry used to rely on, uh, really weren't going to be in the picture, and competition for that market was going to be much more fierce. So they started looking at uh, the civilian market, and they started looking at the camping market. Uh, and in 1948, they hired a guy named Robert Blanchard. Now, by all accounts, Robert Blanchard was an ornery old cuss. I have read some of the things he has uh, written or interviews made up with him. And uh, I will admit that I do have a soft spot for ornery old cusses. I don't know why. But he is probably one of the best hires that uh, Eureka Tent and Awning ever made. Now, in 1951, Robert Blanchard uh, patented a design that some people say is the first commercial a dome tent design. It's not really, uh, if you want to know what that is, uh, I will link to a video at the end of this video. When, when you see the old man and his dog walking down the trail and you see this thumbnail here, click on that. That will take you to a discussion on who invented the dome tent. It wasn't Robert Blanchard, but his design was a fantastic one because it did break ground. It was the first freestanding tent. The first commercial freestanding tent, which means that you didn't have to stake the tent into the ground before you started setting it up. All tent designs before this period, before this particular design came out, had to be staked into, into the ground to provide the tension to hold the tent when it was up. Whether you uh, put it up using a, a shear frame like some of the uh, uh, Abercrombie and Fitch, the Cruiser and uh, Explorer type Forester tents, things like that, the, the shear frame or the internal or external frame that holds the tent up in tension. Okay, but this is the first tent that didn't need to be staked into the ground in order to provide that tension. The frame provided the tension, and it was attached to the canvas, and you could actually pick it up and move it. Okay, and the other thing is it's the first tent where the frame itself supports the tent externally, outside. Up until this point, any tents that were provided with frames did their support from inside the tent. It was truly a revolutionary design, and what is interesting about it is that even though Blanchard was an employee of Eureka Tent and Awning at the time, the patent was taken out in his name, not in the name of the company. Smart move on Bobby Blanchard's part. Now, the design was called the Blanchard Draw Tight Tent. And uh, it was marketed by Eureka 
as well as L.L. Bean. L.L. Bean had a version of it. Uh, Eureka was still a little leery about getting into the civilian tent market. So when they released a new design, they would uh, license it to other uh, vendors and put their name, name on it. You can buy a Blanchard draw tight tent uh, that has an LL Bean logo on it. If you didn't, if you hadn't watched this build this video, you wouldn't even know that it was made by Eureka. Uh, you can also find them with the Eureka label on them. But it was a it was a relatively successful design in what's called the expedition level of tents, where uh, a, a good, hardy, sturdy tent is required. Uh, they did get a military contract for uh, some of these draw tight tents to be used in Arctic conditions. And it was used on a couple of uh, Mount Everest uh, uh, attempts, uh, 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 summit attempts, and, and uh, other expeditions uh, into the uh, Himalayas. But Eureka saw that this was not going to be a huge profit maker because it wasn't attractive to the greater population and canvas tents were starting to lose their popularity due to weight. Now they did start producing uh, family tents, things like umbrella tents and wall tents and cabin tents and they were relatively successful there but they were having a hard time breaking into the emerging backpacking market. So, in 1969, Robert Blanchard got busy and uh, designed a couple of tents for the consumer level backpacking market. Uh, he had two designs come out. One is the one we're about to sh show you right now. Let's go listen to the old guy in the woods talk about the Mount Marcy. Now this is the Eureka Mount Marcy. And this tent here is reflective of the tent design thinking of people who were, you know, let's say, dedicated to the old school. Where Jerry Cunningham broke new ground with his rain vent, we'll call it technology, with his rain vent design. Uh, other manufacturers recognizing that people wanted the light weight of nylon, but that nylon wasn't waterproof by itself, started using polyurethane coated nylon to make their tents. But as we've mentioned before on this, on this channel, Polyurethane coated tents are not breathable. This is kind of reminiscent of the U.S. Army mountain tent and other mountain tents. This particular type of design is called a mountain tent. Okay, it's a A-frame tent with a very short sidewall, very short sidewall. Yeah, it's almost you, you really can't see it. When we get inside, you'll see it. You also notice it's got a lot of guy lines. Well, that does two things. That pulls the tent out to give you some room on the inside, and it helps with the ventilation system that they came up with to ventilate this tent so that you wouldn't wake up in a puddle of sweat. But it's fairly conventional in design, other than the multiple guy outs on either side. We'll do a walk around then we'll go inside. Okay, as I said, simple A-frame design with a lot of tie-outs. You may notice along the side there are some separate tie-outs not connected to the ground. That's a rather large rear window to help with ventilation. And I don't know if it'll come out, but you can see in this example, 
that polyurethane is really starting to degrade here. It's not peeling, but it's starting to turn gray. And back again, the guy outs on the side. And you can see this flap right here. Let's go inside and show you what's going on with that. Okay, and here is the secret of those tie-offs on the other side. To get, uh, oh, this is kind of comfy. To get the best ventilation inside this tent, we have basically a screen window here on this side and on the opposite side of the tent that you can guy out and tie off from the outside. And you can get cross ventilation this way and cross ventilation forward to back. But it's a dang polyurethane tent and not much is going to happen the way it should. You're still going to wake up in a puddle of sweat in a tent designed like this. Now the, the other design that was released was called the Mount Katahdin. Uh, the Mount Marcy was a single wall tent, the one we just looked at, that is polyurethane coated throughout. The Katahdin uh, was a, uh, had a polyurethane rain ply, just like the Jerry Cunningham uh, rain bent tents, where it had a separate ply and a breathable nylon body. Both of them sold fairly well. They were still on the market in 1973 when uh, Backpacker Magazine, in their first tent uh, review art, uh, magazine de dedicated entirely to tents, uh, they did they, they reviewed the Katahdin but ignored the Marcy. Uh, they said that the Katahdin was indifferent in cut, uh, that it was reasonable for the price, but they... Uh, you know, they they praised uh, things like the Jerry's Camp and Air and, and other tents, you know, to the high heavens. And this must have stung Robert Blanchard just a bit. But they sat down and started scratching things on the back of napkins and stuff. And what they did, what Robert did, was he took the same basic design of the draw tight a tent that is freestanding, doesn't need to be staked down, with an external frame. Blend that in with the rain vent uh, idea of, with a coated tent fly and a breathable body. And they came out with the Timberline 2. Eureka's first really big commercial success and probably the most successful tent design of the 20th century. Okay, there's just scads and scads and scads of room in here. Uh, in a pinch, you could fit three people inside this tent. Normally, you'd fit two, and this is more than comfortable enough for, for one man, his gear, and his dog. Uh, beautiful flow-through ventilation, and everything around you is breathable. All the moisture your body exudes is going to go where it's supposed to. Okay, well, here's what she looks like with the rain fly off, so you can see how incredibly simple this tent is. First off, you can pick it up and move it. There's no need to hammer in any stakes, unless there's a high wind and you don't want it to fly off the mountain. 
Everything done with aluminum poles and everything is in tension. You've got a breathable layer, a breathable breathable uh, shell with a polyurethane coated bathtub floor, just like the tents that Jerry Cunningham designed, the rain vent tent. You get We'll get a little, couple close-ups of this, but this is a dog bone. If you lose this, your tent won't go up. Well, the other great thing about this is the instructions are written right on top. You push your poles into the dog bone from the side, and then you put this uh, ridge pole between the two of them, it's done in about five minutes. With enough practice, you can do it in the dark. Here on the top, it says top right. So all you got to do is find the top right. You can probably do it by feel at night. And that goes on the top, and that orients the dog bone perfectly for your three poles to come together. And you can see the whole thing is held up by this shock cord tied into the top of the tent and this tent is almost drum tight so uh, Eureka released the Timberline in 1973 uh, this was the same year that the leg family sold out to a company called Johnson Outdoors they continued to run the company until 1981. Now, some people will tell you that it was Johnson Wax that bought the company, and that's not true. It's a misunderstanding. It's the same family. The same family owns Johnson Wax as owns Johnson Outdoors, but they are two separate corporations, and actually not all the same family members own both companies. Uh, the influx of money that came in from the uh, merger uh, enabled Eureka to market the tent heavily. But at the time, for 1973, the Timberline was probably the lightest weight consumer level backpacking tent out there. Uh, not a mountain tent, not something you would take uh, you know up up onto uh, to Mount Whitney or something like that but it was an awful dang good tent for going down the trail for hiking the Appalachian Trail or you know at your at your local national forest uh, great design uh, it continued to be sold in large numbers for a long long while e even though as time progressed as we get out of the backpacking revolution period and start moving into the 80s and the 90s, the Timberline was still popular. And one of the reasons for this popularity is, is that Eureka entered into an agreement with the Boy Scouts where it became an official Boy Scout approved tent. And literally, I, I, I would tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of Boy Scouts have swept under the nylon of a uh, Timberline tent in the last 50 years. Uh, it has to be an incredibly huge number. The tent was easily scaled up for manufacturing. The original tent was a two-man tent, like what we just saw. But they also made a four- and six-man tent version. Truly a fantastic design. It really was. The tent would still be sold today, except Johnson Outdoors sold off bits and pieces of Eureka Tent in October of last year, 2023. A Eureka Tent no longer exists. And it's only been a couple of months since its demise. Well, there you go. There's the story of Eureka Timberline Tent. Uh, and we've got one more video in the uh, Backpacking Revolution Period Tent section. Uh, 
we're going to turn the channel into a clip joint for a few minutes. We'll see you down the trail. Thank you.